Sometimes, my stranger. Hi, I'm Rob Whiten from the Innsmouth Book Club. Join me and my fellow guide, John Chadwick, as we take you on a fortnightly tour of Innsmouth. We visit places such as the Picture House, the Library and Innsmouth Museum to discuss all aspects of weird fiction, whether it be book, film, music, TV or art. As well as that, we stop over at the Gilman House to have a chat with a resident guest. That includes authors, artists, musicians, in fact, Lovecrafty and creatives of all types. You can find our free shows on Patreon, and there you can also sign up as a patron, which brings you bonus content, plus a monthly PDF copy of Innsmouth News, which features articles, author spotlights, all the latest news and reviews, and more. You can find us at patreon.com forward slash Innsmouth BC. We hope to see you soon, because remember, Innsmouth isn't just a place, it's a state of mind. This episode is brought to you by California Tea House. California Tea House is a family-owned tea store where you can find some of the world's best loose-leaf tea and organic herbal tea blends. Like a fine wine, there is no comparison between fine loose leaf and common broken leaf tea bags. So, yeah, no, check them out. Check them out. They have quite a bit of pretty awesome tea collections. I'm a huge fan of their white teas. Uh, They have a tea club that you can join, but, you know, they've got green tea, black tea, white tea, oolong, that uh, robios and herbal tea. They've also got teaware. So check out California Tea House in the show notes. You're listening to KZOM, Oleander Public Radio. Welcome to People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos with Dave and DB. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. As always, I am your editor and producer, DB Spitzer, to my virtual right, my my co-hosts, the hosts with the most, David Heath and Gretchen. I don't, I don't, I don't even know what to call you, Gretchen, Gretchen Martin. That's Gretchen fine. Gretchen Martin. Okay, because I've heard you use multiple names on multiple. Yeah, things. yeah. Yeah. Gretchen Martin <laughs> works for the most part. All right. <laughs> okay. Cool. So uh, today we are talking about uh, the revelation of Glacky, a Nine to uh, eleven plus volume uh, created by Ramsey Campbell. Uh, I'm talking to Ken Height about how to be a good game designer, how to become a game designer, uh, how to get out there, how to be a good GM, and uh, stuff like that. And then after that, we're going to be talking about Night of the Living Dead. All right. So I'm going to kick things off first with so. In 1960-something, Ramsey Campbell writes Inhabitant of the Lake. Uh, we've, we've, we've talked about Glacky in past episodes. Uh, underwater sea slug guy, uh, spikes, three eyes, makes people into uh, zombies that can't be in the light. And one of those zombies wrote a book. Take it away from there, uh, Dave. Well, before, well, I think we've got to unveil a people's guide to the Cthulhu mythos connection to the revelations of Glacky. Oh, yeah, go for it. So uh, one of the, I think, really good sort of resources out there Uh is the H.P. Lovecraft Wiki. Yeah. Totally. And so when you bring up the revelations of Glacky, yeah, <laughs> quotes from what the book says uh, by uh, Ramsey Campbell, yeah, and it uh, doesn't just talk about Glacky and in, in Inhabitant Lake. He also uses it in cold print. Oh and yes, appears in the collection of Gibson Flynn by oh. Pete Rollick, and mm-hmm. it also mentions 
I Want to Break Free. Oh, by uh, Morris. Edward Morris. Yeah. Yeah. And what do all those three gentlemen have in common? Guests on this show? Absolutely. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. they like Lovecraft? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they all wrote. So I was just sort of surprised when I was looking through it. But yeah, th uh, three people. And the other one, though, and maybe he was on the show before me, is Robert M. Price. We have to go get Robert M. Price. Uh, I, I think we're good. I think we're good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Maybe Blackies will. <laughs> but yeah, I, I was just surprised when I was looking. I go, well, these got to be the other two, you know, Edward Morris. But yeah, three <laughs> out of four people that are cited as versions of uh, the revelation of Blackie in the HP Lovecraft wiki. That's have been pretty crazy. Stuff. I have a question because I'm I'm actually this was my first time coming across the revelations of Glacky. Yeah. And I'm kind of the, I was I it kind of drove me down this rabbit hole of reading like um uh Ramsey Campbell's stuff. Yeah. And I was listening to mostly like pseudopod um reads from his books and they did have one with this piece. And what I thought I was curious about is like is this the the counted the book of counted sorrows for the Lovecraftian universe? <laughs> um, right yeah yeah i think it is i think it is yeah because it has that vibe like a way that like esoterically can use this like quotes but it's actually not something that exists in print but it, yeah it exists in print in the universe but not in reality oh yeah yeah it's okay it's, it's one of the many many books like that in uh the lovecraft universe yes. that's kind of what i thought i was i mean i was reading it and i'm all Huh, I wonder if this is like the count the book of counted sorrows. Hmm. Drink yeah. the tea. <laughs> and, and so despite the fact that we call it you know, well, you know, it's a plural book. So there's multiple mm -hmm. books. Right. Yeah. That's what I was and, reading. And that makes it a really good tool for chaosiums called Cthulhu. Because uh -huh. you can have, you know, it's broken down to again how many versions but it covers different monsters. So sure. you don't want to give them all, your your players, all the Necronomicon or Cult of the Ghoul. You can give them one of the Re Revelations of Glocky and not the rest. Sure, yeah, yeah. You could even definitely do, I mean, normally we tend to go into this stuff at the end of the bit, but uh, you could definitely have like a world-spanning campaign to like, collect all the copies of the book of Glacky or uh, revelations of Glacky, like to collect all volumes of it so that you can stop something from happening. But, you know, I mean, you know, it's like they get like three volumes, like very early on. And then they find out, wait a minute, this is like nothing. We need everything else. And then da, 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 red line across Africa. Da, 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 Saudi Arabia, da, 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 Antarctica, da, 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 you know, and <laughs> just, just have your pulp adventure uh, uh, gathering the revelations of Glacky and hopefully don't go mad along the way. And I was going to ask, do you have to make like sanity checks every time you open one or like look upon it or like yeah, yeah, I'm in the vicinity I, of it? <laughs> Yeah. Definitely, like, definitely. It's across the room. Make a sanity check. What? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's that bad. I think it's 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 once you uh, comprehend what the truth of it is. Uh, yeah, I, I think you can just look at it and flip through the pages and go, ugh, and just make and, a minor sanity check. But yeah, you don't have to do anything super major with it. But <laughs> but what is the truth of the revelation of Glacky? Oh, I, uh, I I think it's 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 kind of like that. Um, what we think of as God doesn't exist, and uh, man does not uh, is 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 not the inheritor of the earth. Not a, not necessarily even that. It's not even man's domain. It's something to far greater, far beyond our comprehension. Something that would make us go mad. And like, mm. you know, 
it's 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 the general Lovecraftian stuff, and it's like, oh yeah, this is all this stuff about this god, and this is all this stuff about this god, and do you know that these creatures are here, and here's a bunch of spells, and this is how you cook people, and you know that kind of stuff. <laughs> And in ways, I think with the revelations of Vaki is the thing that it it was written in like the mid nineteenth century. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is long, but it's not like it was written in seven hundred, you know, A.D. or no. so. It, it, in ways, it's relatively recent. A newer book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's like it's it's written in notebooks, a series of notebooks. Oh, is it? That's yeah, I didn't and, gather that from the. I, I the story it, I heard was uh, that pseudopod one that was like talking about like a bookstore and uh, it kind of reminded me of that um that gosh now I'm like blanking on what story it was but there was have you seen that that BBC show Black Books Yes so yeah, I, I've heard that's it. immediately what I envision like when gotcha. they're setting the scenery of the story I I always thought of like the bookstores in um. Oh, what is it? The ninth gate, the seventh gate, the one with Johnny oh, Depp as yeah. a book dealer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a that would be a that'd be a cool bookstore. I just don't want to be in a Roman Polanski movie though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're probably talking about cold print. Oh, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Cold cold print. And that's the that's the sort of the interesting thing here that I think uh, Ramsey Campbell did with this is this is written by a, a worshiper of Glocky, of course. Yeah. But it talks about Erhort and, you know, Baedes and Dolop and, and all of the, you know, Cthulhu. But it's almost like have you ever how can I say this? You, oh, I'm going to screw and say you can edit it out. Sure. <laughs> There's parts of the New Testament uh-huh. where it almost seems like Paul is dissing Peter, and uh-huh. Peter is dissing Paul. You know, sure. the, the 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 churches didn't quite get along. You know, in the you know first century, uh, you know, AD, mm-hmm. and, and so it's almost like Lackey's zombie is um, spilling the tea on the rest of the celestial family. Yeah, oh. yeah, I like that. I like that. So this, the zombie that wrote the um, the series of books, is basically like laying it all out. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So from from their understanding of the Cthulhu mythos, which we may have like an unreliable narrator here, but right. I mean that that's like. Like Snorri Thorson or such whatever. A, his name. a trope in cosmic horror, whether it be uh, uh, I don't know, Castain from uh, Repairer of Reputations, yeah. uh, or or uh, this. <laughs> I mean, this could be. <laughs> and, yeah, and I, oh, I was just to say that you're right. I think that originally they were notebooks, but I think that they were. Always did put them in printed form eventually. Yeah, yeah. I mm. I I always think of them as like um like spiral bound notebooks <laughs> or mm-hmm. legal pads. But yeah, <laughs> kind of like in seven. Like I I use movie references because I'm like this is how oh, I visualize sure. yeah, it. Yeah, the composition books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the, what I sort of coming from a, a historical background is that you know in the 1850s and so there were a lot of quote new religions unquote yeah so, sure in the u.s but england so we've got a lot of writings of these new religious movements where we have hanger-ons or maybe not the prophet or the minister but the people around them we still have their writings as a historical account yeah and and I see this almost yes, it's got all these spells and, and you know chants and but it's also it, it's kind it is it, it's it's a a witness of historically what happened in this cult. Yeah. 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 And no. No. They got eaten and turned into zombies. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And I was thinking like even if it wasn't like 
wasn't looked on as a cult in that period of time. Those people would have thought of themselves as theologians or like, yeah, yeah. They, they would have thought of themselves as like theologians because they're like looking beyond the veil and understanding gods and uh, kind of like really getting into like, I don't know, that uh, Madame uh, Lavatsky garbage. <laughs> so, so and, and I think so. And in in World, it was written by the, the character was um, uh, Thomas yeah. Lee, yeah, mm -hmm. who basically again, he, these were Blackie's releva revelations, mm -hmm. his name to his cult. But it also talks a little bit about what Blackie saw when he traveled through space, and it yeah. includes it includes one of the more famous spells. In the Call of Cthulhu game, uh, the um, the uh, oh formula, oh, which brings forth the deity Dalof, which I believe was also created by Ramsey Campbell. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of was a sneaky kind of way to bring all of his deities and beings into one sort of book. And then he could throw in stuff like Cthulhu. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's, I mean, that's how you do it. <laughs> I didn't realize like how um, how much of an impact that Ramsey Campbell had on like Lovecraftian like culture and like books and whatnot. Like I, I was very surprised because I'm like I said, I'm kind of, that's that's kind of this is where I'm new to this part. Oh you yeah, know, some of oh, it's totally like cool. um, I. I'm I'm really learning a lot. <laughs> cool. Very cool. And and I will say that he is also one of the most gentle and pleasant people to talk Aww. to. Not only in literature that I've ever talked to myself. Oh yeah. Yeah. No. The parody a, based a, off of him though is hilarious. <laughs> there's a parody of him? Uh are you familiar with Garth Garth Marenghi's Dark Place? Yes. That's a uh, it's the 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 actor is doing a physical parody of uh 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 Ramsey Campbell in the 70s. No kidding. Yes. I yes, thought yes, it was yes. Ghostwatch that he was like kind of doing an impression of, but no. It's also making fun of Ghostwatch, but it's like making fun of like um science fiction writers and like the physical like what the actor is physically trying to look like. If you look up Ramsey Campbell in the 70s, like oh my gosh. Uh, Garth Marenghi looks like Ramsey Campbell in the 70s. I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also adding that back to my list because I kind of like stopped watching him, watching uh -huh. that show just because it, you know, whatever, for whatever reason I got interested in something else. But yeah, so Ramsey Campbell, I'm looking him up and that's his cute old man. Now let's see, so 1970s. It, though, they don't have a picture of him, of course. Oh. Rude. <laughs> it might be 80s Ramsey Campbell, but he's oh, like... Oh, really? I found one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The picture with him with the headless angel statue behind him? Yeah, I That's think so, yeah. Spectacular. Spectacular. Yeah. Thank no, you I for saw bringing that, that to was, my attention. <laughs> I was like, yeah, no, that's that's, uh, that's Ramsey I have renewed Campbell. interest in the series. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, no, uh, Ramsey Campbell, heck of a guy, created Glacky, created the revelations of Glacky, and it was, of course, Augie Dog Derleth who uh, told Ramsey Campbell, don't write someone else's stuff, write what you know. Mm -hmm. So Ramsey Campbell took all that stuff that he'd written about New England and based it in his area of the woods and... Yeah, no, we ended up with a bunch of new stuff, new places, new ideas, and well, it feels right to have like, um, like the the British attachment or like yeah. the to to uh, Lovecraftian stuff. Like, oh, it just, sure, they seem to go together really well. Kind of like when they're you do like Middle Eastern like the vibes also. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And, and as much as I love Rats in the Wall. Yes, mm -hmm. minus the, the questionable part. It's mm -hmm. very much, I think, an American's curse interpret, interpretation of England. Sure. Yeah. 
where Ramsey's cam Ramsey Campbell seems obviously a lot more authentic. Sure. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Because I don't know. I mean, did Lovecraft actually ever go to England, or did he like ever leave? It, it, best of my knowledge, he went to Canada, and yep. that's the other country. Wow. He yeah. That's impressive. <laughs> in fact, I'm pretty sure that in his lifetime, the thing that was most printed was his treaty on the history of Quebec. Interesting. I, I don't don't quote me all those people just listen to me until they, <laughs> <laughs> so all you guys all these listeners are, are like, hey, that's yeah, not <laughs> please send your hate mail care of David at no we'll, we'll verify that next week. But uh, it, I know it was one of his most uh printed thing during his lifetime. Interesting. Nice. I'm learning so much about Lovecraft. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have anything else about uh, the revelations of Glacky we want to cover? I think we have revealed everything. Um, uh, <laughs> just don't read that 11th book or you Gullinac will get you. But we're not here to talk about you Gullinac. We're not going to talk about you Gullinac at all. <laughs> all right. Um, moving on to the next part. Just to remind everyone, if you like what you're hearing, like this episode, share it with people, subscribe to the podcast, find us on Facebook. We're under People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. We're on Twitter. I don't really check Twitter, so it's just kind of the automatic feed if you just want to listen to us on Twitter for some reason. You can find us on any place, any podcatchers that are out there. Of course, Facebook, Instagram, and, of course, the YouTube, where this episode will be. And, uh, yeah, uh, a little bit after this, we're going to talk to Ken Height. And after that, we're going to be talking about Night of the Living Dead. All right, here we go with uh, me talking to Ken. You're listening to KZOM, only on public radio. Welcome to the part of the show where DB talks to someone. Generally, Ken Height, or Scott Glancy, or Dan Harms, or someone else like that. Uh, here's 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 the middle part with DB. Mm. I mean, I've 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 heard yours. I've I've read yours. I mm. mean, no need to go over it. Uh, listeners, if they want to uh, hear, read Ken's harrowing story of being shot over a. Uh, 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 MacBook Air, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you you can, uh, and and how Virgil got a taste for human blood. No one got a taste for human blood. That's the amazing thing. Not even Black Phillip. Oh, amazing, amazing. Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. That was surprised uh, as anyone. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely check out uh, Ken and Robin talk about stuff. Uh, Ken, do you have any projects that you're working on uh, this moment? Like anything that's uh, out and about? I know you have. Tour to Lovecraft, the locations, the but destinations, I, the destinations. But I can't remember if that's your latest thing that's out, or if it's just the latest thing I remember. Um, that and I think Second Inquisition, which is a book for Vampire the Masquerade, are oh, okay. I think my most recent things out. I just wrapped a Vampire Player's Guide, which should be coming out pretty soon. And then there's another vampire book that I'm not sure if I'm allowed to announce, but I finished most of, he said, knocking every piece of wood in the studio. Uh -huh. um, uh, I finished most of my work on, and hopefully that will be coming out. And then there's sort of a bunch of desk clearing things that have to get done before I move into a, another big project. So lots okay. of little stuff, but nothing really plug worthy. Okay. A desk clearing worth job. Wow. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I feel like I know what that means. <laughs> mm. Well. That's pretty cool, Ken. That's pretty cool. Um any any uh any any word on uh Hellenistic uh, D and D? Did that is that what's that? Uh um, Hellenistic is still hanging fire until I basically can get uh, a lot of uninterrupted time to write it. Uh yeah. there was a brief window with the uh uh, OGL kerfuffle where yeah. it almost looked like it was never going to happen at all. And oh, now sure. it looks like it can totally happen because 5e is creative commons. So 
Cool. Uh, I, I'll finish my part of it at some point. I hope to dream this year. And then at that point, I will probably talk with uh, John, my publisher, and we'll figure out, are we doing it for the completely free and open 5e, or are we going to try and aim it for whatever nebulous uh, next D&D is? <laughs> and, um, and that will be a discussion, I'm sure, that John will be eager to have uh, with me, because it will mean that most of my writing is done, and that will make him very happy. All right. Good to know. So... Mm. Now that we're on the topic of gaming, something I really wanted to talk to you about, Ken, is how do you become a game designer? What do you need to know to, like, not not, not only be a game designer necessarily, but to design, like, your own campaign? I'm, I'm not going into the weeds, not, not, not being like, let's have a 20-part Ken Height, let's, how do you design a game world, but... What, what, what makes a good DM? What makes a good game designer? Yeah, well, I think that you've really touched on something with that question, which is that every DM, in my opinion, is a game designer. Sure, because yeah. every DM, by definition, I think, and almost inevitably, has to apply their understanding of the rules to their understanding of their table, and those are never going to perfectly mesh up. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've literally played Pendragon with Greg Stafford, and I know it wasn't entirely by the rule book because <laughs> Greg true. was changing the way that he ran based on the response of the table, which is to yeah. say a GM is a game designer. They're coming up with a house rule. They're figuring out the stats of some kind of monster that they've invented. They're working out, you know, we'll use this rule now, but we won't use it uh, next time because uh, it would be too slow or too fast or or change things up or do a sure, thing that I yeah. don't want the game to do. So every DM is a game designer. And if your question is, how do I become a professional game designer? The answer is, uh, in a, a very, very brief compass, find a game you already know and mm -hmm. love that has an open license agreement write up a monster or adventure or rule type thing or setting or dungeon or whatever you want to have for that sure. game. Uh, put it in a as nice a format as your understanding of desktop publishing allows, or maybe find a buddy who's good at that and get them to do it for, you know, sweat equity. And then, or uh, delicious Chicago pizza, if you're so blessed. Yeah. Um, and or actual American money, also a good option. The larger point being, you take that, you put it up on uh, Itch or on drive through, and you are now a game designer. You are now a professional game designer. People can pay you money for your game. You and I are now peers. We can clink our glasses together at Gen Con <laughs> as equals. And nice. that's literally all it takes now. Uh, when right. I was uh, you know, coming up, it was a whole different universe. There were no open game licenses. There was no electronic publishing. You had to basically convince someone who knew the phone number of a printer to give you a chance. All of that is gone. Uh, we are now in a, a, a better world in general where these barriers to entry are, are down. And if you want to make a game thing, you basically can make a game thing. And suddenly you're there. Um, yeah, I, I keep thinking right. about game design in that manner of what you just spoke of in like late nineties terms and being like, Oh, if I want to do this, I need to like start talking to a printer about doing at least 500 copies. Mm -hmm. And then I got to make sure I'm there for a quality check to make sure all the pages are numbered, mm -hmm. right. And making yep, sure yep, yep. that they didn't do this and make sure that the spine isn't all messed up and all that fun stuff. But yeah, no, now you can just have a thing printed up as you need on Amazon. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or uh, Lulu or any number of platforms. Yeah. drive through has a POD thing oh, where if you put the thing up and that's it's really, you know, and it's in whatever format they require, uh, sure. which I assume is a fairly specific sort of format. They can push a button and you can have a print on demand copy for whatever. Uh, uh, it's more than paying an actual printer to do it because you're doing a one off instead of a 500 off. But okay. you know, that's yeah, that that's all. That's all available to people. Um, certainly, there are many, many companies, you know, both individuals and, uh, you know, larger companies that still do it the old-fashioned way with print buying and, you know, running to order and everything else. And God bless them, but uh, you don't have to. 
And yeah. I've seen a lot of people whose garages were full of a lot of role playing games that didn't sell, uh, <laughs> that perhaps could have done it the other way and uh, been perfectly happy with themselves because the the real uh, job for them was the creation, not the printing. Yeah. Um, I, I've lots of people have said to me over my career, Ken, you know an awful lot about RPG publishing. Why don't you be a publisher? And <laughs> I say, completely honestly, because I've literally never met a RPG publisher, many of whom are my very good friends, who have turned to me after a couple of beers and said, you know what I love about this job, Ken? All the publishing I do. Uh, <laughs> They love the part of the job that I'm already doing. So yeah. I don't see a reason to add more, less fun stuff to my career. Uh, I already have to pay taxes and that's already too much work and, yeah. and unfun to, to deal with. <laughs> so pretty much a publisher is someone who knows editors and also knows print houses, right? And 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 can get equity. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can be a publisher and entirely publish online. I mean, Sure, Again, sure. <laughs> you know, someone who wants to make a physical book, uh, which the gods bless, I point out, physical books are the core of humanity, but um, uh, they're they're asking themselves to do a lot more work than you need to in this year of grace, 2023. Sure, sure. And gotcha. Gotcha. So my next question is what what separates someone who can just publish or find a publisher or, you know, just printing stuff up at home for their buddies or their neighborhood or whatever, you know, just local, regional kind of stuff. Uh, what, what, what separates a, a, a GM, DM, keeper, what have you, from like a good keeper, GM, DM, what have you? I mean, you can be a good keeper, G, uh, GM, uh, DM, what have you, without ever publishing anything. Uh, Certainly. Th those Certainly. are entirely, uh, they're allied because a GM, as I said, is a game designer. Yeah. And a game designer, uh, full stop, is someone who's maybe done it professionally or done it for enough different games that they begin to sort of perceive the meta architecture of, of the art form. Um, you could make that argument. Um, and I think what separates a good keeper from a bad keeper is uh, are people asking you if they can play at your table or are you asking people if they will be at your table. Um, you know, if you, it, it's basically how good are you at doing it? Are you doing it so much that you find yourself uh, with, you know, more than more game groups than you maybe wanted, then you're probably good at it because people want to play with you. Right. Um, and that's really the only hard and fast acid test is, is your table happy or is your table not happy? And if your table is so happy of multiple tables, you're probably pretty good at it. And if your table is so unhappy that everyone's like, oh man, I'd love to, but you know, uh, Mandalorian is on that day. Uh, and I don't <laughs> think I can make it. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, man. And if that keeps happening to you, maybe you're not a very good DM and should, uh, you know, be a player or uh, just, you know, find some other creative outlet that maybe you're a little more suited for. It's, you know, not every art is for everyone in this world. I'm, I, I suspect I would make a very bad uh, dancer, for example. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a pretty really good dancer under even my preferred, you know, seven vodka uh, input. So I doubt that I would ever, you know, be able to do it in a way that it would communicate anything to a, a, a viewer besides that guy's had too much vodka. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. Yeah, sure. I guess not everyone can be a DM, but I mean, if everyone you... can be a DM. Everyone yeah. can dance. Right. Yes. I mean, Correct. I'm not saying I'm not trying to gatekeep the hobby for God's sake. Okay. What You're I'm good. trying to do is saying like any other art form, you'll, some people are naturals at it and fall into it perfectly. Some people become good at it through practice or through, you know, intelligent uh, uh, interaction with their audience. Sure. And yeah. some people are just, they kind of have a ceiling like me dancing. There's just at some point you have to say, well, he means well, good for yeah. him. <laughs> Do you find that there's any skills that uh, work for being a good, good DM? Uh, besides uh, communicating, listening, knowing the rules? I mean, those are three big ones. I mean, yeah. And I, on a given day, I may not get all three of those right, but oh, yeah. um, I, I think a lot of the rest of it 
is your ability to improvise. And I'm not talking about improv like improv acting, although yeah, there's yeah. some overlap. Sure. But I mean improv as in answering ahead of the next guy, what happens if? Oh. So, and I think this is where it begins to blend into writing as a, as a different creative art, right? You can imagine an architect or is, is someone who sets something up, but then the idea is nothing happens to it. It stays that way forever. You know, maybe it rusts uh, decoratively if you've used a lot of copper uh, on the outsides. But basically, it's a, it's a I don't want to say it's a static art, but it's an art that has a finished point, right? There's no end then. Maybe someone 100 years later says, you know, put a door on it or something. But look, yeah. But a GM is like someone in a jazz band. They're always having to improv. They're always having to respond to the next thing. And the farther ahead you can think, and I'm not saying necessarily like a chess player, but maybe a little bit like a chess player, sure. I think the better you're going to be because the players, you are, you have guaranteed, the adventure guarantees the players will go into the forest of ogres. And you've got all the forest of ogres are all written up, you're ready. And the players say, um, we would like to go to the swamp on the east side of the map. And you say, but the old man in the tavern said in the forest of ogres lies the treasure you seek. And uh, they say, yeah. And he also said there were ogres. So we're going to go to the swamp on the east side of the map. So you have to be able to come up with something that is at least as much fun as going into the forest of ogres would have been. And maybe that leads them towards the actual purpose of going to the forest of ogres. So you can salvage some part of the story or maybe just lets you keep riffing and responding as they get deeper and deeper into the swamp. So maybe the, the treasure they get is the knowledge they should listen to the old man and not go into a swamp. Um, but you have to do all of that while making it seem to fold logically from their actions so that they say, yes, I recognize this is a consequence, not just the GM being mad at me. Mm -hmm. um, and also has to be fun at the table so that they say, even if the GM is mad at me, we got a really good fight with those um, uh, 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 marsh ghouls. And that was pretty exciting and fun. And so I don't really, you know, my character regrets going to the swamp, but I, the player, am pretty happy with that. I enjoyed that outcome. Nice. Right? Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, as you play a more detailed world, you have more detailed NPCs, other factions and actors, gods, monsters, whatever. And they have responses as well. And those responses trigger other responses. So the closer you can get to modeling that portion of the world that the game takes place in, the richer and more vibrant it's going to seem at the table and the easier it's going to be for you to improv if the characters say, I'm going to go and try and get married to the daughter of that noble because uh, first of all, I like uh, romance role-playing. And second of all, uh, I like... Uh, living in a noble house and not in this uh, stupid uh, uh, gutter that we live in now. Yeah. And <laughs> then you have, if if that's completely out of the blue for you, you're going to be stumbling around and clumsy and you don't know how that noble fits into anything. But if you've been building this organic picture of the, of the town or the city in your head, yeah, you know, who's going to object, you know, who already is interested in the daughter of that noble, you know, that, um, uh, the, the noble has got, you know, interests and concerns. And while normally he wouldn't even think at a gutter, look at a gutter dweller coming for his daughter, he does have a lot of lumber concerns in the forest of ogres. And maybe if someone helped him out with that, we could maybe start talking a deal. And so you have ways that your characters and their goals fit into the rest of the world and how the rest of the world responds to the things changing at the character's behest. And that for me, it comes from reading a ton of history, uh, being interested in politics, sort of, you know, just generally being alive to, um, you know, uh, uh, drama and, uh, you know, fiction, uh, seeing how stories crack out, how people behave, how characters behave, which is not always the same thing. Um, and basically having a lot of different go-tos so that, you know, something that I read in a comic book 15 years ago might mm -hmm. inspire my idea for, oh, this would be a fun thing that happens, even though the players are doing a thing I did not expect. And <laughs> yeah. um, having that sort of arsenal in your head of fun consequences, set pieces, but also of what's the logical response. If the player characters decide to invade uh, Poland, you know, in the 17th century, yeah, 
you know, what happens? You know, uh, we know that the king of Poland is mad, but what else is going on? And we have a lot of questions and we can have all manner of different responses depending on um, uh, what feels good at the table. And so it's it's never not going to come down to what are your players going to enjoy, different from what are the characters going to enjoy, obviously. Uh -huh. yeah. But it also should, in my opinion, have some uh, organic reality to it, some truth to it besides that. Otherwise, you're just catering to them and, uh, you know, you're basically, um, you know, like uh, the lowest common denominator uh, cable, right? It's just, you know, uh, explosions and, uh, and and boat chases. And you can have a great amount of fun with explosions and boat chases, but at some level, maybe you would like your art to be about a little more than that. Sure. Yeah. No, definitely. Definitely. I, I feel like I had an aha moment in eighth grade when I was doing a report on Montana and had to like list, you know, the name of it, its capital, its imports, its exports, and how many people lived there and all this other stuff. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is like Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I can write this stuff and started like making up my own things. And it just was that simple. And it's like, from that moment on, I was like, I'm a dungeon master now. Yep. I can figure out how much gold is mined. And then I'm like, wait a minute, who mines that gold? Well, they're not good. So probably slaves, huh? Okay, where do they get the slaves from? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh man. And it's like, as 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 you've said on Ken and Robin talk about stuff, start start with what you know and it's like start with earth start mm -hmm. with and it's like oh okay so well and, and it's just like and then slowly I, I i figured out the campaign world and i was like oh yeah that's cool um an another question i have for you uh is um uh, if if a fantasy role playing isn't someone's cup of tea is 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 there anything that you would like highly recommend Role playing wise, for people who want to role play but don't want to play an elf and don't want to throw fireballs or that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, as, wanna... as you know, DB, I consider yeah. the absolute apogee of the art form to be Sandy Peterson's Call of Cthulhu. Sure, sure. So I would absolutely recommend uh, seeing how they feel about uh, being a, a, an investigator of the occult uh, horror and. You know, you can do lots of Call of Cthulhu adventures that never touch on the Cthulhu mythos if they're Definitely. allergic to H.P. Lovecraft or if you want to, you know, maybe spring that on them later. You Because that basic Call of Cthulhu engine can and has, for me, driven, you know, standard haunted houses, vampires, yeah. uh, werewolves, all manner of uh, conventional horror can be built by a conventional adventure, gangster adventures, right? I mean, yeah. I ran whole you know 1920s gangland back and forth stuff with uh basically with just with call of cthulhu and like the map out of uh gangbusters if you remember gangbusters way back yeah. in the day yeah <laughs> um so um i would i would suggest you know trying call of cthulhu seeing if they would like to be human uh people caught in some sort of uh dangerous or better yet scary adventure and uh you know by now, there are so many different role-playing games, many of them quite good, mm -hmm. that almost anything people want to play, uh, do you like Star Wars? You have your choice of, like, I think three different Star Wars games. Hell yeah. Uh, one of which is uh, an absolute warhorse classic, and I think the newest one is actually pretty good. Or you could play uh, Scum and Villainy, which is a Star Wars-esque uh, uh, serial numbers filed off uh, version of Blades in the Dark, if they also like capers. And so it's like, would you like to nice. play Leverage, but in Star Wars? There we go. <laughs> so almost as recondite as their tastes are, uh, you can probably find a game that will mesh or even match. Um, but my my first go-to would be Call of Cthulhu, of course, because, you know, if someone comes to you and says, I'm interested in food, you don't say, well, let's start you off on oatmeal before we work up to actually good food. Sure. You know, yeah. Let's, you know, <laughs> see see how they respond to steak or sushi and then, you know, work sideways from there. Definitely. Definitely. All right. Cool. Cool. 
Um, is there anything you think people should like shy away from? I mean, I, I, I don't want to be like negative about like, I'm not saying like, is there a specific game or anything like that? But it's like, how do you know if you're maybe not in a good group? Well, I mean, you're not in a good group. This is one of those, you know, look around the table. Um, okay. <laughs> and if everyone is having fun but you, uh, are you the problem? Yeah. Uh, okay. Or are they having a different kind of fun than you like, right? Um, there are many, many people who are, love uh, every inch and every uh, bonus of, a, of Pathfinder, for example, yeah. that the sort of very dense, perfect gear-like uh, whirring of Pathfinder makes them happy all over. They love the mastery. They love the rigor. They love the, uh, the, the knowledge that there's a side case and an edge rule for everything. These mm -hmm. are the same sorts of people often who are very interested in hero or GURPS or some of the old universal systems. Um, but other people, uh, they, they may just have a cognitive processing problem. Like I probably could never run Pathfinder because there's too many rules for me to keep track of. And I okay. maybe could play it, <laughs> but it would be annoying to me to have to keep paying attention uh, in case I was accidentally traver uh, transgressing a rule. Um, I prefer a looser system than that. Some people prefer even looser systems than the ones I like. The people who you know consider fate to be ridiculously constraining, uh, and I consider fate to be on the very edge of you know point your finger and say bang. So. Um, Many, uh, many different tastes. Uh, again, like I say, someone likes food. That does not narrow it down. Um, All right. <laughs> you have to, you know, some people can handle spice. Some people can't handle spice. Some people love complex flavors. Some people think nothing's better than a big hearty bowl of stew. No one is wrong in this discussion, sure. but yeah. uh, everyone's got a different palate. And I think your palate for uh, role-playing games is like your palette for any other kind of art. Some people love modernism. Some people hate modernism. It's just, you know, you're responding in some way. And we have a bit of an advantage in role-playing because we have, um, uh, we have more excuses for our rejection of an art. And so we can deploy those in a way that ideally doesn't make anyone feel bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's not you. I just don't like Pathfinder. And they're like, well, yeah. that's cool. And they're not like, you know, how dare you? Well, I guess someone is how dare you because of the internet. But <laughs> in, in real life, they're they're generally not how dare you. Um, sure. But uh, you can you can generally find a group that you're at. I mean, the way that you, uh, uh, you know, you your job, whether you're the player or the GM, is to make the table uh, interesting, fun, and welcoming. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, if it's none of those things, you're at a bad table regardless of, of whose fault it is, yeah. in my opinion. And it might be your fault. You might be the problem child, in which case, again, a little, you know, self-assessment, or maybe it's a time for you to, you know, uh, take up the player role and, and try and, uh, you know, get cues from everybody else. See, well, if they seem to be having fun, uh, maybe I should try a little more of what they're doing, a little less of what I was doing that no one liked. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Stop, stop windmilling your arms into other people when you're dancing, to use my previous <laughs> example. Yes, no, definitely, definitely. And I, I think my final question here is, um, Inspirato, inspiration, Ken, what, where do you find inspiration for, where, where can you find inspiration? Where do you find inspiration? And what's, 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 what's good inspiration for, uh, designing uh, something, whether in your bedroom or for a bunch of people? I mean, it, it, it really varies. Um, it, as a professional, I find inspiration in, you know, what the client wants nine times out of 10. Yeah. Um, I did not roll out of bed and say, I'm going to redesign Vampire. Um, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've played Vampire. So as, uh, you know, again, every every gamer is a uh, is a game designer at some level. And I knew that I didn't like botch dice. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so when I was given the offer to redesign Vampire, I said, we're removing botch dice because I know those are bad. Yeah. Um, but, you know, what what gave me the inspiration was being hired to do it um, at my own table. What inspires me is, you know, just do I see a movie that I'm really into? Do I read a book that I'm really into? Do I see a new game that I just really want to play uh, right now? We are finishing out our uh, supers game. We're sort of 
starting the long final act. Um, yeah. it'll, it'll probably run for a few more months, but we're looking ahead to the next stage. And some of it is just, I've never played Pendragon. Maybe we'd uh -huh. like to play Pendragon. Um, right. Some of it is um, uh, uh, Swords of the Serpentine just came out, the new gumshoe swords and sorcery game. I'd like to play that, but I'd like to play it in historical Venice, not in the uh, uh, fantasy city of Eversink where it's set. So that is a different sort of a, of a goal or an urge. And, you know, I read books set in Venice or I see a movie about Venice and I'm now I'm I'm hyped up. I want to know more and do more uh, with King Arthur. Obviously, there's acres of things that inspire you. But in some cases, I'm just inspired by the existence of Pendragon and of Greg's great Pendragon campaign. So it's, you know, almost a, a one stop shop of inspiration there. And then a, another possibility is Unknown Armies in the Golden Age of Hollywood. Um, mm -hmm. And that is, you know, partially inspired by seeing Babylon and really not liking Babylon and thinking, what would I have done with that same story if yeah. someone had given me all the money that they gave Damien Chazelle? Um, and, uh, and it's like, well, for a fraction of that budget, I can have an Unknown Armies game that does what I would have done with early Hollywood. And maybe that's a possibility. So there's negative inspiration just as much as there's positive inspiration. But in terms of the the meat, I find that what it is 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 weird little anecdotes or character bits or things that I want, like, you know, the fact that Wyatt Earp, you know, the, 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 the great old West lawman basically retired to be a technical advisor on Westerns in yeah. Hollywood and spent like the last 20 years of his life doing that. Yeah. That just fascinates me and other, you know, not just lawmen, but like outlaws, bank robbers drifted into Hollywood in the twenties and thirties to become technical advisors on Westerns. <laughs> That's crazy. And that, that that dichotomy for me is is just super. I mean, so many stories is like, what if you know some magic thing happens and suddenly we need Wyatt Earp back? You know, uh, you know what what's going on with that uh, story? And this is of course the same period where Bugsy Siegel is coming to Hollywood and uh, palling around with actors. Yeah. yeah so okay. you've got all manner of just in, individual facts and historical uh, trivia tidbits that I have just sort of rain down into my head. And I'm more inspired to say, what can I do that will maybe let me use most of this stuff that I uh, uh, know and am fascinated by? And you could say, what's the inspiration, Ken? Was the inspiration seeing Babylon and getting mad? Or was the inspiration, you know, <laughs> 25, 30 years of reading about, among other things, you know, the growth of Hollywood and, and uh, the movies? Or is it just watching a bunch of old movies? Was that really your inspiration? And you just want to, you know, you know, do a world where people can meet Joseph von Sternberg or Marlena Dietrich. And that's actually what you want to do is just a bunch of silly voices. Who oh, say? sure. Right. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that. Uh, yeah, no, I, I want to throw in something else, which is like the, the magical, like sometimes you're doing something and the stars align and you see a name and then you go, wait a minute, this name, I just read something about that name. And it's like all these things happened in one year at the same time. And you can mm -hmm. be like, I yep. can make a story out of that. Let's say that so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so were, -and -so, and -so, you know, or you watch a movie and it reminds you of an article that you read earlier that day. And it's like, aha. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm running a fall of Delta green game set in 1968. And a lot of the stories come from look up Wikipedia find out what happened in June of 1968, oh, what yeah. looks like a Delta Green story. There was a, no, sure. an actual UFO encounter at the uh, missile base in Minot, North Dakota in 1968. I said, well, that has Delta Green all over it. Let's <laughs> let's do the sequel, the secret UFO encounter that they didn't, you know, let out into the press that actually was the Mego. And then yeah. you figure out, you know, what's going on in a Delta Green type universe with that story. And then you send your players to get uh, brutally savaged by it. It's great. That's yeah. No Wikipedia for a DM. You can, I, I don't want to say don't do all the research, but it, if you look up something in Wikipedia, it tells you where else to go and look stuff up. Right. And, if you and it's, to, and it's super interesting, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you'll know immediately, do I want to go down that rabbit hole or is that, Oh no, that wasn't as fun as I thought it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you really want to go down the rabbit hole, it tells you what actual physical books you can look up. <laughs> right, yes. It gives you better sources than Wikipedia, which is really all you want in life. 
Definitely, definitely. That's my favorite thing about Wikipedia is it tells you where where to find the real stuff and maybe pictures. Mm, right. <laughs> wow, Ken. Um, thank you so much for coming on today and talking about, uh, I don't know, how to be a better DM. And honestly, it sounds like be a good listener. Don't be a jerk. Figure out if you're the problem, if the other people are a problem. Don't be a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, time, patience, practice, uh, research. Mm -hmm. And again, don't be a jerk. Am, am I missing yeah. anything? I mean, those seem like the bigs. And yeah. don't, you know, don't be fooled into thinking research is just stuffy, you know, mining the archives for 1930s Hollywood. That's no. what I do. It, it, it can be it, it as could be simple watching as movies, watching going to a, a, yeah. a museum. It could be <laughs> yeah. uh, just screwing around uh, with your friends and looking how personal uh, dynamics happen. Uh, oh, read sure. fiction, do whatever, you know, all art in my experience anyway, is fuel for all other art, right? Oh yeah. If you yeah. are in a beautiful building, that architecture should also be informing your own art, right? Um, Definitely. And if you live a life where you can do as much uh, that is good and fun and artistic as you can, and I don't even say elevatedly artistic, I'm saying, you know, you could be drinking, you know, macro brews in a dive bar listening to a cover band. That's still, that's three different arts that you're in, in, imbibing right there. Yeah. Um, and you're doing it in a specific way and in a specific environment, which is really the core of um uh, of of GMing is being aware of that environment being yeah. you know don't be thinking about the next thing don't be worrying about some other thing be present in the moment listen to the players watch the table you know be ready to respond and you know to some extent that's just advice for life right but it's yeah, certainly advice yeah. for GMing <laughs> yeah no no I mean I mean I I feel like all the advice that you've given for uh, being a good GM. I do feel like it is like also kind of like, you know, good advice for being a good person or at least someone who gets the most out of life as possible. Well, I mean, by and large, it's, you know, because the hobby is literally about people having fun together. Yeah. Um, it it a lot more good advice out of that, I think, is practicable than a very, very solitary art. I mean, sure. My best practice advice for a painter might actually make you more antisocial, uh, but I think that <laughs> best practice advice for someone whose literal artistic goal is making other people uh, happy and excited and uh, thinking about their likely problems. Yeah. Yeah, that seems, again, I'm prejudiced, but it seems like it is pretty good advice for life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Ken, thank you again so much for uh, coming on the show and talking to us about about life. Always, always a delight. <laughs> uh, talk about life or anti-life or any topic in between. Uh, All right. Maybe. It's thank always you good again. Fun. Yeah, yeah. Thank you again, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Right. Thanks, man. All right. <laughs> for a spine-tingling, nerve-shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters. You won't believe your ears when you listen to Monster Kid Radio. Here are your hosts, Derek M. Cook, and his ever-rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classic and sometimes not-so-classic monster movies. Subscribe to Monster Kid Radio through iTunes or Stitcher. Or visit MonsterKidRadio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster Kid Radio. Go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Price, and Joel Hodgson. Listen to discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the HP Lovecraft Film Festival, Classic Monsters, Modern Talk, and the Head of Rondo Hatton, only on Monster Kid Radio.
Okay. So, hey, everyone. Uh, lately, I've been doing a lot of 3D printing with any cubic 3D printers. I've been printing up my own minis. I've been printing up uh, goofy-looking owls, uh, uh, ninjas, skeletons, all 20, 28 millimeter scale. Uh, been able to uh, print up all kinds of cyberpunk computers and uh, taking old 3D images of uh, IBM uh, mainframes and ENIAC mainframes and cyberpunking them up. All I got to do now is role play anyway. So, uh, and, and you know what? I got it on the AnyCubic Cobra Go. It's the Assemble It Yourself 3D printer kit. I highly recommend it. It'd be an awesome gift. Uh, what is it, March? Well, Dad's and Grad's Day is coming up in just a few months. Mother's Day, too. You know what? Some moms want a 3D printer. Uh, you know what? You tell someone what they could use a 3D printer. Everyone could use a 3D printer anyway. Who wouldn't Any want a 3D uh, printer? Yeah, I mean, I, there's some stuff I really want to make, some, like, hair accessories and things like that. Yeah, yeah, no. And uh, they have all kinds of filaments available with them. But if you don't want to get their filaments, you can go online and get filaments that act like wood. You can get filaments that glow in the oh. dark. You can get transparent. Uh, and, and okay, so the glow in the dark stuff, it's not just the dumb green anymore, just that, that, mm. that like, kind of like, Ooh. it is the spooky green, but you can get spookier greens and eerie blues and like kind of fun rainbow glow in the darks now. Ooh. And all kinds of different uh, matte finishes, gloss finishes, silk finishes, transparent, as I said before. Not through our sponsor, but if you just like go online, go to a store that specializes in that stuff. But the Cobra Go is a really, really, really good uh, 3D printer. And I had a friend who told me his settings for his printer and uh, all the things that he's done to like dial it in and do all this stuff. And my prints looked pretty good. And then I looked online how to make it better. And someone said, these things are kind of idiot proof. You just kind of go with what they say. And once you auto scale it and put it all together properly and make sure it's all fitting good, it's ready to print right then and there. And so I just factory reset it today and my prints are looking amazing. And yeah, no, and that's, I don't know if that's because I put it together right or <laughs> if, if they're just a really good printer. But anyway, I think it's a team effort with me and any cubic. Enough of this. Dave and DB go to the movies. Dave and DB go. Movies. Dave and DB go to the movies. Dave and DB go. I want to talk about a movie that my kids said it's mostly about carpentry, it seems. <laughs> Yeah. So, Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> I mean, sure, there's a lot of carpentry happening in that movie. Lots of nailing, lots of breaking wood apart. Lots of finding wood randomly. <laughs> in, in I know, I, watching that, I kind of looked around my own place and went, oh, I'm, I'm pretty screwed. <laughs> like, I could pull some doors off, maybe. Well, yeah. I got that. Other than that, I just have maybe my weapons. We'll see. <laughs> like, I'm like, it's going to happen tomorrow. Like, come on, Bob, come let's, let's go. Yep. Oh, yeah. No, I think Dave's probably the best uh, best off of any of us uh, yeah, being out in the middle place, of nowhere. Dave. Okay. We're yeah. going to bug out to Dave's place. Yeah. Just, we... just know where the keys are for the gas pump. Yes, always. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Don't like just let it be one random like there's one random key ring downstairs like that's where you keep your gas pump key ring. <laughs> it might have been on cousin George himself, but <laughs> maybe so. <laughs> All right, so we've we've I think we've made enough inside jokes about Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> uh, if you haven't seen the movie, I you can literally see it anywhere. Uh, right before the show, we were talking about how. 
I have multiple copies on various formats. There's so many formats you can watch it for free on YouTube. Uh, it's it's it's, it's embedded in the Wikipedia page. Yeah, it's embedded yeah. in the Wikipedia page. Internet archive. Yeah, right. Internet archives. That was another one, and. There's so many copies, uh, so many different variations of this movie. There's the uh, night. Uh, th there's the 20th anniversary edition where uh, there's extra scenes added. There's there's the colorized version. Um, there's high res, low res. There's the Criterion edition that apparently is beautiful. Uh, oh man, I could have watched it on my Criterion app rude oh yeah yeah that would have been way better than the internet archive <laughs> dang so do you want to say why there are so many copy versions oh is it, yeah it's a public domain it's it has, public yeah it has I been public know. domain since day one yep no kidding yep do you want to tell the story or you want me to oh you can go for it dave so they went through a bunch of different titles, The Night of the Creeps, The Night of Abu uh, Anubis, and right up until they were going to to uh, get it out to the uh, the uh, theaters, it was The Night of the Creeps. And then they said, well, last minute, we're going to go to The Night of the Living Dead. And mm. so they sent it out to someone to change the titles, and they didn't put a C. So back then, 1968, if you didn't have that C in your title, it wasn't copywritten. Mm. That, and, and it's a two-edged sword. Romero didn't get all this money that he could have gotten off of it. But so many, especially in the 70s and the 80s, so many small local TV stations broadcast it because they could do it at no charge. Yeah. That it boosts the cult following. Yeah, I don't think there would have been a cult following. I don't think it would have made its way outside of Pennsylvania if if it was like, hey, I made this movie. Um, it would have it would have died then and there. It would have been this 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 thing that people picked up sometime in the eighties or nineties, and then maybe we would have gotten a sequel to it. But I, yeah. I really feel because of its cult classic following so quickly on and its midnight movie stab sa uh, status so quickly on being played in grindhouse theaters and whatnot, just like that's that's like that's the time that George Romero received money to make uh, Dawn of the Dead <laughs> because he didn't make very epic. much money from the crazies and some like Vanilla <laughs> and I like the crazies. I love the crazies. I love the crazies, but it didn't have anything of the same following that Night of the Living Dead does, unfortunately. I, I think the crazies is an amazing film. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no. Um, do you want to talk about the film, Dave? Gretchen? Well, well I'll, yeah, no, of course I want to talk about it, but Gretchen, do you want to add something first or? Um, let's see. What is there to add? Hmm. I mean, other than that, like, uh, this film in itself was revolutionary for its time. I mean, yeah. let's, let's, the, the, one of those blanket obvious things of like having a black male character as the, like the, like the final girl was, yeah. and well, he wasn't really the final girl, sadly, he didn't have to, a very good end, but I mean, he almost made it. Sure. And that was, I mean, that time period, that was so, that people had never seen that on the screen before. No. So so people asked, you know, asked uh, Romero, you know, why did he cast uh, Dwayne Jones as Ben? He said, why did you, you know, why was your main, why did you cast a black man as your main character? And his response is, I didn't. I, I cast the best actor for the role who just happened. Absolutely. Yeah. Did Dwayne Jones go on to do much more films? I mean, I know he did a few other things. So Dwayne Jones, besides he did do some movies, mm -hmm. but he also became his degree was in literature. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I know he like worked on other films like he was in wasn't didn't he do like wasn't he with Beat Street? I and think Losing so. and Ganja and Hess? 
<laughs> yeah, yes. But he was also the head of the English department for uh, Antioch Community College. Oh, yeah. rad. Yeah, so, so definitely. And that's, I think, so when you see like Ben's intelligence, uh, it, I mean, he's a great actor, but he's not acting there. That's him. No. Yeah. Uh, something I, I don't think anyone's uh, brought up lately is uh, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. Is I think it's Bobby or Billy. He wears the striped shirt that looks weird on black and white or on color TVs. Uh, <laughs> old, old color TVs. Is uh, he the guy that's supposed to look like the monkeys guy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he is a rock or was a rockabilly singer at the time that that came out. No kidding. Yeah, he was he was <laughs> known in the area for being like kind of a country rockin' singer. And uh Judy was the uh receptionist at uh Leighton Image or yeah, yeah, uh Leighton Image where the couple that live or that <laughs> live downstairs, the couple in the basement uh were business partners who owned the company that uh, produced the film. And Judy is the uh, secretary for that company. They didn't, they figured that they could save some money, but they told everyone we couldn't find anyone better than her. And honestly, it's like, we have an attractive secretary. Let's convince her to do the money. We'll save a ton of money. And, uh, I can't remember whose kid it is that they borrowed. <laughs> oh, to play the, yeah. To play the little kid, but yeah. Yeah. And uh, another story I love is George Romero is like, you you really don't have to like try that hard to convince people to come out and play a zombie. Yeah. And uh, the woman who. Uh, but they never said zombies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the woman who is in the basement, I can't remember her name for the life of me. Uh, she also appears as the zombie who eats bugs off a tree. Oh. And and she swears up and down, I'm not the naked zombie. I'm the zombie who's eating bugs off the tree. <laughs> I remember watching that and going, that was a choice. Yeah. That was a choice that was like, I'm going to eat this bug and commit to this moment. And then... I mean, we later changed zombies into only eating brains, but like, you know, in that moment, they were still just ghouls affected by comets. Yeah. yeah. And, and speaking, though, of, of not trying very hard. Or not comets, space probe, sorry. Mm -hmm. space, but uh, not trying very hard to get people to uh, play the role of zombies. They did one of the sequels in Ventura County in the 80s, and they were, they were had an open casting call. So all me and my friends, we were going to ditch work or school that day and show up at this riverbed and uh, try to be zombie extras, but they, they they canceled it before they did it. But Oh, boo. Dang, you could have oh, been in it. I don't even remember which one it was, but... Was it around 1982? Uh, it could have been. I was thinking maybe closer to like 85, 87. Okay. But. Oh, it was it? No, I'm thinking it, it was probably a sequel to uh, Return of the Living Dead. That sounds like it. Okay. It, it was one of them, but yeah, yeah. They, they, they they canceled the, uh, or they they told us they canceled the casting call. Maybe they just didn't want us. <laughs> <laughs> that would be rude. Yeah. <clears throat> but very true to Hollywood, you know. <laughs> but yeah, no. Um, the film didn't cost that much to make. I believe it's somewhere. Oh, I lost my screen. I had IMDb up, but uh, it it didn't make. It, it didn't cost very much money to make. They cut corners everywhere they could. They had people living out on the set, setting stuff up for when everyone got off work at night. Some people's it, it didn't have any running water, no electricity. Oh, no. And this wasn't the days when you could just haul out a, uh, a, a generator or something like yeah. that, rig something up. 
And uh, even though they did hull out generators, uh, they had to have way far away to like rig up lights and stuff like that for the interior shots. Uh, but, well, that but, makes to the field because like, I mean, there wasn't any power in the house anyways. Cause remember there was a moment where they were like, there's no power, there's no phone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was no phone cause uh, the zombie walked Hold past it. and knocked it down. And, oh yeah, uh, but, that's right. She was like pulling down there, or was it he? But they were pulling down the um, the cord that was coming across the yeah. back in the day when they used to string them across the chops. Yeah. <laughs> um. And yeah, no, the TV worked because first, it's you know word of mouth. Then they find out stuff on the radio, and then they find out oh, stuff yeah. on the TV, and then it's back to word of mouth. <laughs> Why did I think that their power didn't work, though? I was it don't because, know. Did they say something about the lights or something like that in the house? Or maybe they kept saying, like, turn off the lights. I don't know. I, don't know. I, wa- like, I watched it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I think there's a lot of stuff inferred. And uh, there's a lot of stuff you have to infer to kind of, like, follow the story. Yeah. Um, it's it's a great movie. It's easy to follow, but there is a lot of stuff to infer. And that's something I like about Romero films is you don't 100 percent know what the bigger story is going on. You just know the story of what's going on with the people as communication breaks down. I mean, there's 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 stuff that you don't know about from the crazies. There's stuff that you don't know about from Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead. There's stuff that you don't know from his later zombie films. Yeah. Even though I, I, I feel like when you start getting into Land of the Dead, it's kind of like everyone's talking about like, okay, we're filling in stuff for the how the world is now because this takes place in the future. But other than that, um, like you don't know what causes the uh, zombie outbreak well, that's the thing is, like, I'm I'm curious is, like, because they're talking about how it was um, radiation from a space probe that came back from Venus. Yep, yep. So what's up with Venus? Why? I don't know what's up with Venus. <laughs> <laughs> is, is Galaki involved? I don't know. I don't know if uh, Romero had some sort of future plans for Planet <laughs> of the Dead. Well, I know that he got influenced by um, the, the I Am Legend book. Sure, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it makes you wonder, like, I mean, what was the main, what caused, that was science that caused the, or like a germ, right, that caused the the issues in I Am Legend? Oh, I'm I'm bad at this one. <laughs> <laughs> right, I think it was a, a it's okay. science-related plague. Oh, okay. So we can't tie them, but I was just, I just knew that that was a, I'd seen that, that he was, he had quoted that as a source of, of reference of, like, why he made them ghouls or zombies or whatever the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so before this, and, and we kind of just, uh, DB and I kind of discussed this when we, were, we did a uh, on um, a Monster Kid Radio, where we oh. discussed this, if everybody listened to, what, two weeks ago, Monster Kid Radio episode? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the things is that there was some scientific zombies before this. Uh, Herbert West, reanimator. Yeah. Uh, totally. But most of the zombie movies, and there were a lot of zombie movies before this, were traditional Haitian voodoo zombie stories set in Haiti or the Caribbean. Why or zombie? Or yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one I always think of. I always That's think of one. Bella Lugosi's eyebrows and that. Oh my God, they're glorious! Oh yeah. My spouse's eyebrows were gonna are gonna look like that. I tell you what, as he gets older, <laughs> I'm noticing it. They're gonna look like a Klingon, like old school. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, is there any any <laughs> any kind of like violent undead kind of zombie things before Herbert West Reanimator? I don't. Not that I could think of. The closest so, I can think of is like a singular Frankenstein's monster. 
Sure. So there were a fair amount. In fact, I just got a a collection of pulp zombie short stories. Oh. Uh, and one of them was um, Henry Cutner's uh, Graveyard Rats. Yeah. Uh, so th- there were there were a fair amount, but they were all like they were pulp stories. They were mm-hmm. easy to knock out pulp stories that didn't have a lasting influence. All right. Hold on. But at the time, uh, because William Seabrook, I believe, returned back from Haiti. And so his book, uh, Magic Island, or Mm -hmm. Magic Island, one of the two, really stirred up this idea of zombies in America. And that's why the first wave of zombie movies. All right. Mm -hmm. But they were all pretty much voodoo magic. Yeah. Interesting. But yeah, no. And then there was, I, I I really feel like until, and, and there's, there's probably a film I don't know of, but I feel like until uh, Night of the Living Dead, there really wasn't this kind of like, uh, arm sticking out. Oh, I definitely shuffling. think it was a great grandfather film to that, that whole ideal. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 then then there was like a slew of Italian films and German Absolutely. films. Absolutely, like those um, what City of the Dead and you know all those, the um, the Dead Collection. What is it? That is that like um, Bava and all kinds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, movies. Yeah, yeah, those are great. And and it it always seems like it's it's like. Um, Oh, what's what's uh, the Blind Dead collection? That's what I was trying to remember. But there's 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 ones that have like uh, zombies that are also like uh, ancient monks, and the oh, blood yeah. all very like tomato ketchup and yeah. And there's there's oh man, it's it's also it's it's zombie films, but it's also giallo at the same time. <laughs> oh yeah, the Curse of the Seven or uh, um. The Seven Golden Vampires, even though I mean, like they weren't really vampires, but yeah, that. Oof. Oh, there's. I, I feel like there's there's a ton of them. There's a ton of them, and it's like that's I, like I, a I, whole episode on itself. <laughs> yeah, no. And uh, a billion years ago, for Easter, I rented a bunch of zombie movies. Nice. And uh, they all ended up being like Italian zombie movies that I wasn't a, a, aware of that what that what they were. They were just in the zombie section. And I was like, what are these? This is crazy. But yeah, no, it's like kind of like Templar Knights and monks and and, and just like these like uh, rubber masks, skeleton kind of things that they put stuff on. (laughs) And some questionable animal practices. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, yeah, zombie films, where you know they're they're pretty great, and I, I I guess like there was like the third generation would be everything that happened in the '80s and the early '90s up with uh, uh, Return of the Living Dead series and stuff like the Dead Hate the Living and all that kind of fun stuff. Dawn of the Dead. Oh well, that's yeah. Actually the '70s, but yeah. yeah, yeah. And 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 then. It's it's like we don't have anything until uh, rage monkeys infect people in 28 days later, and then we get Shaun of the Dead and Dawn of the Dead coming out at the same time. <laughs> and then Romero gets money again to do his Land of the Dead and all that kind of fun stuff. If I'm missing things, let well, me but- know. Diary of the Dead, wasn't that one of them? That, or was that a Romero like um co production? I think that might have been a Romero co production. Okay. It might have been Solid Romero. I'm not one hundred percent sure, but I think other people were involved with that. Uh, I saw a ton of documentaries about around that period of time. I saw a ton of movies <laughs> about Evil starts coming out, the video game. Yeah. Mm. Which is I think very influenced by by this. Oh, definitely. 
but there were so many movies that aren't even zombie movies that are inspired by Night of the Living Dead. Like, I, f I feel like there's a fair amount of Evil Dead that's inspired by this people trapped in a cabin. It's, oh, yeah. Siege films. Like, it has a siege film vibe to it in a yeah, lot of ways. Yeah. Like, there are people trying to hold out, and then there's an oncoming force, and it's a siege. Like, that is, from um, formulaically, it feels like that. Yeah, but it, this time, it's it's not a maniac with a chainsaw, or it's not, like, someone with a drill, or, you know, if we're going with, like, horror tropes, it's not some maniac with an axe or something like that. Mm -hmm. And if we go with, like, the older, older stuff, it's it's not, like, an army. It's not, like the local militia it's not like devils it's it's not aliens it's 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 the undead and that concept moving on into science fiction even though like later you have movies where it's <coughs> aliens creating undead that are then sieging a sorority house night mm. of the creeps <laughs> or or plan or... b <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought you were going to go into Plan 9, which is pretty dangerous. Or Plan 9. I said Plan B. <laughs> yeah. Plan B from outer space. No kidding. Well, I mean. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sorry. Plan 9 from outer space. I guess maybe Plan 9 from outer space predates Night of the Living Dead for uh, space stuff reanimating the dead but mm. they're not really zombies they're just i i don't know dead they're yeah. they're like they're like on, on a kaiju level they're like the king Ghidorah and <laughs> space godzilla <laughs> yeah. they're being controlled they're being controlled <laughs> yeah they're 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 just walking around they they're, they're, yeah it's they don't have any free will they don't have any kind of like I mean, even though uh, Haitian zombies don't necessarily have free will, it's like they're yeah. just being controlled by a computer. Uh, if that computer, or if, uh, I'm 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 being far too generous. Uh, if that piece of cardboard was to be turned off, <laughs> <laughs> if that piece of uh, wood uh, was to be turned off. Um, you know those 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 animated corpses was cease to function. Yeah. Um. But I don't know. It's like, hey, that's that's pretty close. That's pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> and the imagery of them rising out of their graves. I mean, is comical, but it's 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 part of the the zombie trope. Yeah. Oh, I love yeah. that that first zombie that we meet, like as a brother and sister get out of the car and he's all, they're coming to get you, Barbara. It's just, it's so like, it's so dread instilling. Yeah. And, yeah. but also like ridiculous too, because it's yeah. like how that actor who's playing the zombie is like, uh, and he kind of at them a little bit. And then they're, they, they don't, they walk really slowly away from him. I, I, I just think that was so strange. Yeah. I saw somebody acting bizarre in a cemetery, and not just because I've seen a lot of horror films. I would uh -huh. be like, yo, we're just going to go the other direction. Yeah. I mean, that's generally how I act in general. It's like, that guy's on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say that's how you act when you normally meet people. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Not quite, not quite. But yeah, no, no. When I'm I'm in the city walking around, which is every day, if if there's someone like, I'm like, all right, I got to cross over here. <laughs> I'm like, I pull out my pepper spray. Let's go. <laughs> but I don't. If it was a zombie, it wouldn't work. No, it wouldn't. No, but. All right. Uh. Quick question for everyone before we move on. Uh, sure. Favorite zombie film besides Night of the Living Dead? City of the Dead. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go light and soft. I'm gonna say Shaun of the Dead. 
Oh, Cute. that's a good one, though. That's a good one. I was going to say uh, Return of the Living Dead. That's a good the, one, too. The, the cable stable of 1983 through 85 or something. <laughs> it was on a lot on Showtime in, like, the 80s. <laughs> I watched it a lot as an unattended child. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other facts that we think we want to talk about with Night of the Living Dead? Just the one thing I, I really like about this is the thing that makes good horror quite often is isolation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They were isolated in the fact that they couldn't get out or send a signal out. Yeah. But still got the radio signals in. They still got the TV. So the information, the, getting the information to them didn't make it better. It made it worse. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I imagine if there was a remake of it now and someone's trying to, like, use the Internet, they're going to get all kinds of stuff. Or there's also going to be, like, news. And there's also going to be the conservative channel that's trying to tell you something else or some some something like that but anyway <laughs> or depending on your politics there's a, a progressive channel that's trying to sell you i'm not even going to pretend that i i i, I yeah um <laughs> when i say city of the dead by the way i mean tombs of the dead i'm sorry i oh, mean yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. the city of the dead is like one of the other names but tombs of the dead is the most common knowledge common name for that oh, okay okay does that one have a weird uh, adult actor pretending to be a child? Yes. Okay, I know exactly which one that is. That's so good. Mother, your breath smells of death. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it uh, at the Hollywood Theater. It was uh, at, like a all-night movie marathon. It for, I saw it there on the big screen for the first time, and oh, that was incredible. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to People's Guide to the Cthulhu Myth. Of, I think that's this episode. Uh, I you think can, so. Yeah, you can check us out on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on YouTube, on your face, on pgttcm.com, anywhere you find podcasts. Tell your ma, tell your pa, or I'll ship you down to South Agua. Uh, PGTTCM.com is also where you'll find T-shirts and stickers and posters and all the information that's going on and all the latest episodes. Uh, anyone have anything they want to plug, websites, anything like that? Mm, I did a voiceover for a short film called The Haunted Baby Carriage. Oh, I'm ooh. playing like a... Yeah, I'm doing the voice of like a. I'm an I'm an impression of Mia Farrow in um, Rosemary's Baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So that's, that's a, awesome. I'm playing a character that's I'm basically like what's the voice on that you hear on the television. Okay. Oh, oh, I gotcha. Yeah, um, and then uh, I'm doing um, an article. I got interviewed for by Staples Fine in Portland, Oregon. That um, we plug in the show on. Very cool. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Dave, you've got kidding season coming up. Anything else? No, just, uh, you know, since we talked about uh, Ramsey Campbell, uh -huh. uh, friends over in the uh, Innsmouth Book Club is going to have one of the first uh, uh, Lovecraft festivals in England. Wow, yeah. that's cool. We'll get some more information as we get closer so people listening in England can, can see it. But uh, Ramsey Campbell will be the... Uh, the guest host or guest of honor. Oh, oh wow. Cool. Now I'm all like fangirling him. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm super excited. We should we should try and get him back on the show. <laughs> Make him come to Lovecraft Film Festival. Oh yeah, yeah. I saw him in two thousand six or two thousand nine, I can't remember. <laughs> oh really? He was he was at the festival? Yeah, he was at the festival, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, everyone, have yourself a good night. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye.
that was a good episode. Thank you again, everyone. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was so silly. I, I like, I totally had That's... forgotten the name of the my favorite zombie film. Duh. No problem. Not a problem at all. Well, it was like I kept seeing City of the Dead, and I was like, wait, that's not it. That's not it. It's something else. And I kept looking over at my Blind Dead collection, and I was like, Tombs of the Blind Dead. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs>